Welcome to the Social Impact Journal, the global development show talking to the founders, experts and innovators driving change in our world. My name is Jack Farron and I'm your host and today we have a very exciting episode with Ness George Stanley and Samba, an entrepreneur and filmmaker based in Uganda who specialises in capturing social impact stories through his two projects, the Ghetto Film Project and Ness Motion Media. Ness, welcome to the show. Pleasure's all mine. Thank Great. you for having me. I'm sure you're, you're more used to being behind the camera than, than in front of the camera. It's really <laughs> awkward being in front of a camera because <laughs> I spend 90% of my time behind the camera. So I can imagine. Yeah, but it's a pleasure. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. So I know you've captured social impact stories uh, across Africa and been to some, some really crazy places as well. Yeah. But why did you get started in this sector of filmmaking? Um... I think as a storyteller, they, everybody's telling stories. Um, and we as Africans, we are born storytellers because mm. it starts from the fireplace. But then as you grow, you wonder, what can I use? Uh, what what good are my stories to society? And um, I think for me, what re resonated with me is uh, there's a documentary they made about my mom's life called Greta in 2004. And uh, it won at uh, Bubblegum Film Festival and Spike Lee gave the award. And that image remained in me. And I always wondered how can I tell stories that resonate with people so that we can create a world that each one of us wants to live in. And uh, I just realized NGOs, on the other hand, are doing a lot of social work, mm. that very good work. But most of it is told in a narrative that doesn't really fit what I would want to be represented as an African. Most of the stories have kids that, like, basically the, the imagery doesn't really reflect well. And I wondered how can we still communicate the impact or the need and urgency of these uh, organizations, but while telling stories that are more positive. Right. And that's what got me started with the social impact stories. So it started with a film about your mother. So, so yes. if I if I can ask, what was the film about? Um, basically. My mom has lived with has lived HIV positive for over I think 29, 30 years, and um, in the nineties HIV was really it's not like HIV today. You can tell someone is positive, and but she fought through that in a period before ARVs and all that stuff. So her story was about just the resilience of a woman that just hung on for the sake of her free kids, because we are all she had. And she fought through life just to protect her three kids and stayed alive to see who they're going to become. So basically, that was the documentary about. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So then you decided you want to go into to filmmaking. Yeah. So what was the steps that you, you had to take to, to get into the sector? Um, initially, I started off as an animator. A three okay. Year okay. Animator. Nice. Yeah. Nice. I'm self-taught. And um, but it got to a point where, yeah, I knew how to read cameras in the in the software, I knew how to create characters and everything, but I really needed more. Mm -hmm. And it takes a lot to do animation. And I started with a small Kodak camera. It was a picture camera, it takes about three pictures per second. So I figured with animation, you need six frames to create a motion picture. So I would take multiple pictures, three frames, three frames, and I would make my stop motion kind of pictures. Yeah. And how, that's how I got started. And um, with time, I think the passion grew from just what can I do with a camera to how can I tell stories. That's mm. when I started mm. writing stories. Then I started producing stories, then started directing. Wow. And um, I ended up quitting university where I was offering a degree in uh, a bachelor's in industrial and finance, major in photography. I had a disagreement with the lecturer, so I quit <laughs> university. And a year later, I was lecturing at a university. Wow. So, yeah. That's a, a full circle moment. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. you fall out the lecturer, you quit, and then a year, you, you, you're taking his position. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, I mean, that has been my journey. I think from there on, it's when I realized it's really expensive to pay for film school. Mm. And only the rich kids can get in. But people with talent, those that need to tell stories, don't get in because they don't have the money. And that was the beginning of the journey for me to set up the Get A Film Project, where I could lecture film for free to anyone that wanted to learn film okay. and see what they use the skills for, but also teaching them the way of creating impact through stories. And so we've been doing that since 2012 to right. date, every right. single Saturday. So 
that's the Get a Film project. I, yeah. I can't wait to talk about that a little bit later on. But I know your your first company was was Nest Motion Media. Yeah. Of course, named after your yourself as well. Yeah. Um, so what was the the initial goal of, of that company? Uh, so basically, Nest Motion Media, my co-founders are the ones that decided. You know what? Uh, as Nest, you already have a name in the industry. Let's use the Nest name and just add it to Motion Media, mm. and uh, that's how the name Nest Motion Media came about. But um, basically, it came out of um, we had this vision that we want to create. A, we want to we want the world to view Africa or Uganda in a certain lens, and it was our stories weren't portrayed as that. It was either war, mm. uh, disease, and all that stuff, and that's not what Africa is all about. We are happy people. Even with less, we still create more. And so we wanted to create a company that would tell stories that have basically social and economic um, stories that would inspire the next generation, but also portray Africa as a more positive place. Yeah. yeah. So Ness, with yeah. Ness Motion Media, yeah. I know you've traveled across Africa, you've done many different projects, and there's a couple in particular that I want to, to look into with more detail. So one of them was around the COVID vaccine. So what exactly did you do to, to share messages about how the, the vaccine was being administered? Uh, so that, that was with Gavi, the okay. Vaccine Alliance. Um, so Gavi got in touch with me. There was a shipment that was coming in. I think it was the second shipment of vaccines that was sent by UNICEF that was coming into the country. Um, but it, it was a long process to get clearance. And they gave me leeway and they, say, they asked me, do you have positive vaccine stories? of hard to reach places. You've traveled all over the country. Do you have those that stand out? And I gave them six stories and they told me, yeah, please go ahead. And I think for me, of them, two stood out. One, that we nearly drowned in the lake. And the second, wow. that we nearly fell into a crater on top of a mountain because it was really windy. And um, we, we were basically following a nurse who okay braves the whole journey you have to step i don't know if you know the ninja walk you have to do the mm, ninja mm, walk when you're mm. on top of the crater because it's really really high and very windy if you make long steps you could be blown to inside the crater or the other side on the slope of the mountain and to me this is a person that is 56 almost 60 years old and she's like i won't let a kid die under my watch and she braves that um mm the journey but for us when i'm shooting with a gimbal i was filming her walking and i was going backwards and oh, no. i kind of lost it and forgot that you have to do the ninja walk backwards and i made some two <laughs> long steps and we have it on a drone they, they filmed that moment i nearly fell the oh, other side wow. of, the, of the crater because it was really windy yeah and um how yeah. how how thin is the is, is, is that it, is it's that? really thin like if i had to put my legs wide apart uh, one of them would be in the crater the other one would be on the slope wow. the side. it's really really small wow. and this lady would make that work and when you're sloping down into the community you have you can't stand while sloping so you have to sit down and basically slide on your and this mind. this lady she's doing that every day regardless of the vaccine this, yes, this is she, a community she health worker every week she every week because people in the community can't cross over okay. to the nearest uh, health facility. So she decides to bring uh, these services next to them. Uh, whereabouts is this in, uh, in Uganda? That is uh, towards uh, Mutanda. Mm. That's in Kisoro. Okay. Yeah. And uh, the second one for me was um, there is uh, an island in Mayuge, but it's closer to Tanzania, but it's a Ugandan island. So on a speedboat, it takes you two and a half hours to get there. On a normal engine canoe boat, it takes you about four hours. And if you're rowing, it will take you about six, seven hours. And there is this young man that decided no health worker wants to make that journey because the waves are really high and it's a very long journey and it's really risky. But he said, there are kids that are going to die that side if we don't take the vaccines. And so we followed him through that journey I remember at a certain point I was filming and we nearly lost the camera to the water because the wave just hit, the boat almost capsized and he was seated still. 
he was used to the whole journey. I can imagine. Yeah. Wow. And uh, the engine stopped working at night when we were coming back. Midway, we couldn't see the land anywhere and stuff. And so how, it was scary. How long, were you, how long were you out there on the way back? Um, well, uh, what was supposed to be a two and a half hour journey was about three and a half journey, uh, hours. Because at some point, the waves kept hitting us and taking us far. Mm. And they never told us the engine has stopped working. All they told us is, yeah, this is something normal. We have to switch off the engine so that the waves don't hit. But when we landed, the other side of the shore is when the guy told us, you guys survived because the engine stopped working. And so for me, it's really fulfilling getting these stories because it's not about my journey, but it's about the journey that these people make. I made that yeah. journey once, but these people make these journeys back and forth, back and forth. And I get fulfillment in knowing that they get the acknowledgement that they need. They don't even do it for the press. They don't do it for anything. But it's such human stories that teach us that each one of us mm. has a responsibility to this planet. Each one of us does. And when you look at your limitations and say, I won't pursue that, then there is something or there is someone somewhere that is deprived of what you could have offered them. It doesn't have to be financial. It could be just a smile yeah. that someone needs to go through the day. So to me, those are things that really drive me to do what I do. Wow. Because, you know, these are two unsung heroes, yeah. right? Where they don't need to. They, they, within their, the parameter of their job, I'm sure the lady, she doesn't need to cross over yeah. where you've got the risk of the slope of the mountain and the crater. Yeah. I'm sure she works in other communities on the other side. Yes. But it's that, that community does not have access to the, the health facility. Yeah, it's so called it, Motel, Motoliro. It Motoliro. doesn't have any access wow. to a health facility because she takes that journey every week and yeah. that goes above and beyond what yeah. she's doing and you know one of the reasons we actually set up the social impact journal was yeah. to was to give a platform to change makers to talk about their work i would love to be able to somehow bring the bring those both on one day and, and learn about their story and the and the experiences that, yeah, that sure. they go through and i guess yeah. as a filmmaker being able to witness and, and travel to those areas must be so fulfilling, as you say. Yeah, it's so fulfilling because to me, heroes are not those that the government gives medals every single day. Heroes are those people that go unseen, but mm. actually create the impact behind mm. everything for society to fully function. And to me, um, they might look as regular day-to-day -day people, but to me, I'm honored because I'm meeting the real change makers, yeah. the people that are responsible for someone else to have life. Mm, mm. And yeah, there, there is nothing, there's no amount of money that can give you the pleasure that you feel from that. It, it takes away all the risk. It takes away all the risk. I can imagine. Yeah. But when you were on that boat, when you were walking, <laughs> yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure there was, you know, you were nervous at times. <laughs> no, I remember um, there was a phone call I made to my wife. There was a wave that was hitting and the engine wasn't moving and I kind of sensed there was something wrong. And I remember calling my wife and I told her, okay, I think this is the time you switch off TV and you go and pray for us because I'm not sure we're going to make it to the show. I swear wow. to God. And she just told me, you know what, hang on to where you are and you will get to the show. Yeah, yeah. And there was a friend of mine that said at that point, he was texting his girlfriend and telling her, keep this text because it might be the last that you may have. But we always make it to show. Just yeah. recently we made a very long journey and found ourselves in Rwanda by mistake from Uganda How through did that the Echuya forest. <laughs> so wow. what happened is our car broke down. We had two cars. So yeah. the U US Forest Authority had uh, the lead car. And we had been to that place the previous day. So we told them, you know what? You guys first go ahead. Let's first figure out the car. We shall come in. Mm. There was a difference of 30 minutes between the two cars. So when they sent us the pin, we went to a wrong location. Okay. And they started telling us, okay, now when you get to vegetation that looks like this, call. And in the forest, it's easy to get lost. So for about four hours, we kept missing each other. And finally, the guy calls us. It was already 4 p.m. We started following each other at around 11 a.m. At 4 p.m., he calls and says, please, forget the forest because it's on a hill, on a mountain. What do you see on the other side of a hill? And we say there is bamboo on the side of a hill. And he just tells us one thing. Okay, guys, figure out how to slope out of the forest and go to the neighboring community and find your way out of there because mm. you've already crossed to Rwanda and you could be arrested because wow. you have a drone, you have all this equipment yeah, and stuff. Yeah. So please get back. And 
it was a journey that we had already walked for four hours. We were tired yeah. up and down the valleys and hills and stuff. And we're now thinking, okay, how are we going to make four hours back? And mm. the army finds us, what shall we do? And one of the guys called and say, told his wife, if I don't call you back, I'm sending you a number of a guy that knows where they last left me. And that guy was wow. me. So we always go through those issues. We've been to places where they tell you the rebels are now coming. You guys have to pack up very fast. And, but I think for me, it's just fulfilling to see the result mm -hmm. after that. We don't usually share the stories of what we go through, but it, because we don't want to shadow the story of the people that we film, because those are the true heroes. But to, 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 to document yeah. those social impact stories, yeah. they're not easy to find, right? Yeah. So, you know, you, you told me before we went on air that you call yourself a, a film nomad. Yeah. That you're willing to travel to, 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 any, to any place, to any, to any region to capture the most impactful story. And they're not easy to find. So yeah. I think the journeys you've taken are, are quite symbolic of that. Yeah, I think, um, yes, I call myself a film nomad because um, just as a, a pastoralist would always want to have grass for their cattle and they always move and find grass for the cattle, regardless of whatever they go through, it's the same thing with me. Mm. I believe each minute I sit home and maybe watch TV and do all these things, there is a story that is passing by that needed to be told that could have affected the world in a certain yeah. way. So basically what we do as the company is we have a quota. So we say we are going to work on six big clients. For every six big clients, we shall look for four organizations that need our help, that really need these stories mm, told. Mm, mm. And we shall go looking for them. Yeah. Whether they have a budget or not, we shall go looking for them and we shall tell the story. Because I believe it's important for us to tell stories, regardless of the limitations of the individual yeah. or you. Stories have to be told. And for an NGO or, or a nonprofit, which is which is the you know, the majority of our audience, yeah. telling stories is a is a big challenge. They need to tell stories to attract new donors, new volunteers, new partners. And they have different ways to tell those stories, right? They can use blogs, they can use pictures, social media, video and film. So yeah. what would your top tips be for a nonprofit or an NGO that is looking to, to record their next documentary or use film as a way to increase their, 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 their visibility to, to new partners? I think uh, usually when I'm talking to NGOs, the one thing I tell them is, let the person watching feel good at the end of the video, not okay. guilty. Yeah. So in the past, the approach was, let's make them feel guilty. Mm. Okay, you are um, seated in a fancy restaurant and you have all these, but there is a kid starving in Africa. Yeah. Look at what they're putting on. Look at where they sleep and all this stuff. I'm saying, okay, that guilt works, but I don't really think necessarily that's how human beings are meant to connect. Uh, to me, I always tell them, find the good. In the bad okay, okay yes these people are struggling with this and this and this but what's that one thing they can do that they excel at yeah. make that the anchor of the story okay and let the challenges that they face be part of the process to the journey to this point mm -hmm. um that approach works a lot why we all relate with struggle regardless of what struggle it is um i struggled with drug addiction for about seven years i did struggle in my teens i struggled with drug addiction and but the person that actually liberated me off that was someone that was struggling because they were sexually abused by their uncle they had a problem that i felt was really urgent and i felt like maybe mine is it like i i didn't feel alone in mm. that moment so we're all struggling with something this person may be struggling with the fact that uh they can't access medical care but you are struggling with the fact that you can't get good housing you are struggling with something so we all relate with struggle and that what that's what pulls people to take action mm. um when you use the approach of guilt one you are not um you're not counting into the value of two people, the person that is giving, but also the person that you are filming. Because I have that first hand 
an NGO paid for me school when I was in school and stuff. But I hated the fact that everybody that went to the website had a photo of me that was six years old. Yeah. And it didn't really look good. It didn't really represent me. Mm. And so today, I usually ask myself, before I take this shot, if this kid, if this lady, if this person six years later came and looked at this product, yeah. would they still feel good about themselves? Or would they wish they never did it? So you have to put the human aspect before the financial yeah. gain to it. Yeah. We've done that for so many people. For example, Hospice uh, Africa Uganda was at the brink of closing because of COVID. And it's one of the organizations that we gave in our services and we said, you know what, we're here, let us know what we can help you with. And they had their approach, but we also had our approach. We told them we shall do everything for free if you only give us um, control over how the stories are supposed to be told. Okay. And they gave us the beneficiaries and we plotted the stories and we did six stories for them for their fundraising and they fundraised way beyond what they expected yep. was going to be the outcome. So I think NGOs have to also change their approach to storytelling and put the human being first before yep. the money. Yep. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I think people watching are really going to take that that advice and um, I can see there's definitely shifts in in, in storytelling yeah. and there is there's a lot of talk in the sector right now about community-led development and really putting local communities and community-based organizations at the centerpiece of, of how their development should be done and that's also how their story should be should be told as well. Yeah. So back to Nest Motion Media, You've, you're working with the US Forest Service, you mentioned around your work with Gavi and the vaccines. I also know you had some work in, in Nigeria. So how did that go? Uh, that was UNICEF. Okay. So basically it was UNICEF and um, it's a collaboration with UNICEF and uh, the KNVC and the Nigerian tuberculosis or something. And they had a product called Delflight. So it's a Delflight imaging system, which basically someone has a quick scan and they can tell them about their situation with tuberculosis. And to me, this was an interesting project. Yeah. One, what made it interesting is uh, where it was and how many people didn't want to do it because it was in Kano, mm. which is one of the most unstable places in Nigeria. It's an Islamic state and there's a lot of kidnappings, there's a lot of raids, there is rebel activity and stuff. And But to me, this technology, I thought, was game-changing and I wanted to see where the story leads. So I took on the project and I remember just getting to the airport, the Uber that picked me up. The guy asked me, what are you here for? And I told him, I, I'm here to film for a few days in Abuja. Then I'll be heading to Kano. And he asked me, why do you want to go to Kano? And I told him, yeah, there's stories there. He's like, no, it's not worth it. Why do you want to go to Kano? And he kept telling me how many kidnappings were there, how foreigners are at risk and all that stuff. And when I got to my hotel, Ugandans and Nigerians are different. This was in Abuja or? Yo, in... Yeah, my hotel was in Abuja. Yeah. And Ugandans and Nigerians are different. Ugandans will want to make you feel safe. Mm. So they would kind of cover up some stuff. Nigerians will give you as it is. So I just asked my <laughs> host, I'm like, yeah, so I heard that there is lots of kidnapping. Like, yeah. Then she <laughs> picks out on the internet and begins checking stories. Like, I'm like, okay. And so a way, <laughs> a, a way to put the fear into you before, yeah. before you travel. <laughs> yeah. And, but I couldn't turn back. And I wasn't going to turn back. I really wanted to yeah. follow this story yeah. through. And everybody knows if you're going to Kano, go before it's dark because they're kidnapping the night and we followed that mm. and we decided to take a domestic flight from abuja to kanu an airline called eric and we had it known whatever politics is in there we was supposed to leave at 1 p.m arrived there side at 2 p.m okay. and they kept rescheduling the flight and we ended up leaving at 9 p.m wow so now and so now you you're arriving into into e darkness yeah exactly and the other filmmakers that i was with one is called victor is um Banner Boy is a drone guy. Okay. And Victor tells me, yeah, actually, a, a colleague of mine, they kidnapped them along that road that we're going to use. But he, he told you, yeah. he told you when, when you landed? <laughs> no, when we were on the flight, we were in the oh, air. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm like, that's not what you tell someone. Yeah. Yeah, but um, long story short, we went, filmed, no incident at all, and we came back. It's a beautiful country, beautiful yeah. food and all that stuff. So, yeah, 
it, it was really good. Well, that's like what you said earlier, you know, to, 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 to really capture those stories. Yeah. You have to go into maybe, you know, previously kind of unreached places where people are not going to, to capture the best stories. Exactly. Uh, for me, I think everything about me uh, say you shouldn't go to Kano because I have dreadlocks. Mm. And these guys were like, oh, we don't know how people will feel about that because yeah. it's a more Islamic place. Then I always put on shorts when mm. I'm going to film. And they're like, yeah, I think you have to put on something longer. I don't come with shorts. But to me, it was that I think what resonates with me is there's someone I filmed earlier on in my career. And they say refusing to do what you're supposed to do doesn't save the day. Mm. And to me, it's that refusing to go to film, if I was on that I was going to film, regardless if I stayed back in Kampala, yeah. I could die. Mm. If I travel to Kanu, I could die. Like, if it's your day, it's your day. But if I took the risk and took the story, um, I'm telling someone's story to the world. Impact needs to be communicated. Yep. And I'm just proud that I get to reach those places. Wow. Yeah. So the start of our conversation today, you talked about the cost to get into, into filmmaking in yeah. Uganda. And this was an inspiration for why you started the Ghetto Film Project. Yeah. So what are the goals of that organization and, and how are you supporting young people to, to now get into this, get into this uh, sector? So the Get a Film project is really huge. Um, and um, I do film. This motion media work really fulfills me a lot. But I think it's the work with the Get a Film project that completes me. Because okay. um, I started the organization in the place that I grew up, which is Naguru Godown. Mm. Uh, it's still a hub of crime right now. But when I grew up, it was really, really bad. We all grew up in crime. I saw my friends get killed. Um, I myself was one time in the hands of the mob. Like, so you grow up and see this pattern happening. Uh, the organization that paid for me took me to a school that I had a chance to interact with rich kids, I would say. Mm. And I think there was a mindset shift and I didn't see life the same way. But my friends were stuck in the same life. And in Naguru, if you grow up, it's either you end up dead or end up in jail. Those are the two things that you would be. And I didn't want that for the kids that are growing mm. up there. And I realized the only thing that I had at my hands at the time was I had art, I could do music and film. So I started an organization that uses music, film, art, and sports to rehabilitate, teach, and educate kids and youth in Naguru. But um, also, on the other hand, I felt film was really expensive. When I was lecturing, I was losing lots of my students that were really good but they wouldn't come back this next semester because they didn't have the funding. Mm. And so, and those that had the finances were kids that didn't really care about school. They basically did film so they didn't do the hard courses at university. Okay. Yeah. And so I decided to teach film for free and use film to change society. So what I do is I don't charge anything for someone to learn film. But the cost you pay is your film class runs from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. From four, between 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. when we leave, your job is to make a friend with those kids that come through. Your job is to help counsel these kids. Your job is to be available to yep. them yep. when they need you. And we've realized over the 12 years, that we've, uh, 10, 12 years that we've been around, that it's really been effective. Mm. We have kids that have joined us who are six years old. They're now volunteers at the organization at the age of 18. We've seen the place change. We've uh, seen the rate of crime also go down and we've kind of become like the hub in Naguru that everybody runs to. When there is child marriage going on, the, the LCs will call us when there is something. So we've gone and expanded out of film to see how we can make our community a better place. Yeah. And right now, as we speak, we have 23 kids between the age of 15 and 19 who are studying film. And wow. we've given birth to some of the biggest filmmakers in Uganda. There is Samuel Xavier Chizito, the Roy Chintados. All of them came through the system of the Get a Film Project. So I feel like film is also a tool that can be used beyond just making yourself feel good and earn money. It's a tool that can be used for social justice. For sure. Yeah. And I guess looking now at some of the, the graduates of the, the Get a Film Project and seeing them in the sector working, I know that some of them work with Nest Motion Media as yeah. well. That must be so so fulfilling to look back and, and see the journey that they've taken. 
yeah, it's fulfilling because um, I remember I always had a goal. And I say, the minute I have my first child hit the age of five, I want to be a dad that is available 24 seven because I didn't have a dad growing up. Mm. So I want to be fully invested in my kids, uh, my kids' lives. So it was also important for me to build a generation that will take up after me. It's not that I'll run away from film, but other than because right now I spend about 20 days a month out of Kampala, out of home. I don't want to be absent in my children's lives. Yeah. So the people that I have trained not only get an opportunity to have a job, but they also relieve me of that time that I would have spent out of home yeah. so that I could spend time with my family because time lost is time you can never gain back. So it's great to hear about the, the Ghetto Film Project and you know all of the, the graduates that have came through. Now, this episode has been... Uh, for, for me anyway, a real, a real learning curve and I'm sure for, for our audience to see all of the challenges that you've been through now, how you're using film as a way to really communicate impact, but also shine a light on people that are taking that extra mile, the unsung heroes that maybe they haven't been spoken about before and you're giving them a platform to, to be seen and to, to be valued. There's one question I ask to, to all of my guests on the Social Impact Journal, but I, I rephrase it sometimes depending on, on the context. So. We have our book here, The Social Impact Journal. Yeah. So you now have your own book. And yeah. if you used one page of this book to, to write a piece of advice, but your advice will be to, to a 10-year-old in Naguru who is joining the program and is coming, starting to use film and play sports and, and do music within the project. What is your piece of advice for them in the next few years? I think the piece of advice I would have for them is you are not your environment you are the environment you create so just because you grew up in the slums doesn't mean that you have to be of the slum it is who you think mm. you are and who you think you are is only limited to who you want to be never stop dreaming because that's one thing that no one can take away from you amazing ness thank you so much for coming on the show Thank you for Pleasure. all of the work you're doing. I'll be following very closely Pleasure and so, wishing you a great Christmas and New Year and into next year. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for having me. Wow, what an episode that was with, with Ness George Stanley and Samba, learning about his stories and about how he is using film to document and share impact. I hope you enjoyed it as, as much as I did. Episodes are out every Monday at 9 a.m. GMT on YouTube and also on all major audio platforms, including Spotify, Apple Music, and Google Podcasts. If you enjoyed the episode with Ness, please do subscribe or follow on our social media channels. 